Hello and welcome along to yet another episode of In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo. I'm also known as the Urban Birder. Tonight's subject fits my criteria, my ethos completely like a glove, like a like a cap on someone's head. It fits beautifully. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight with uh, a young lady called Rosemary Moscow, who's written a book, which is a guide. It's called A Guide to Pigeon Watching. But before we say hello to her, I just want to say a couple of things. Firstly, that tonight is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics and also by um, the Deputation de Cathras, which is a, a tourism board which looks after the northern um, province of a region in Spain, southwest Spain, called Extremadura. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I must, I must say that when it comes to pigeons, I used to, well, I've, I've had a mixed relationship with pigeons. When I first started watching birds as a kid, I'm looking out my window, I'm looking at, I mean, in, I'm in London, so the birds I'm looking at are, you know, blackbirds and sparrows, but I don't know what they're called. So sparrows are baby birds, starlings are mummy birds, and blackbirds, which is our equivalent of your American robin, they're daddy birds. Um, but then pigeons were ubiquitous and I saw them and I knew exactly what they were and I used to study them all the time. I had a little notebook and I'd write down all the different types of pigeons in terms of the different colours of plumage that turn up in the garden and what they ate and all that sort of stuff. And I used to watch them fly over and I used to love them. And there was a guy that had, um, a, 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 he was, he was a pigeon racer. And I remember watching their flocks of pigeons flying around when he exercised them. And I used to call them in my mind the press gang. I don't know why, but you know, they used to sort of press against each other. And I used to love watching them fly around. But then when I kind of sort of expanded out, Rosemary, I'm confessing to you now, by the way, when I, when I expanded out and started watching birds per se and began to realize what, what was what, pigeons began to sort of fall into the background, you know, oh, there's a pigeon, you know, and I never really took much notice of them. Never, I wouldn't say I hated them, but I, I wasn't in love with them. I never wished them any harm or anything like that, but I just wasn't in love. And then recently, um, maybe about six or seven years ago, I walked into a, into a bookstore because I was out shopping and I was bored out of hell or bored into hell or whatever, bored out of my mind shopping because I hate shopping. So I went to a bookstore book and I picked up a book and the first page I opened was feral pigeon or oh, had pigeon plates. And I looked at feral pigeon and I thought, wow, that's actually, you know, I've been ignoring this bird for so long. And then I started watching them deliberately. And I really appreciate the fact that they move around with such beauty and speed. And they are quite beautiful birds. So before I carry on anymore, Rosemary, good evening or good afternoon even. How are you and where are you? Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, I'm doing well and I'm in the US Northeast. So it is a nice, beautiful, sunny afternoon. And I'm really excited to be talking to other pigeon enthusiasts or potential pigeon enthusiast converts, I guess. And that's the thing, because when people say, in, certainly in Britain, when you say you're a pigeon enthusiast, you kind of think, <gasps> because you kind of imagine some weirdo in a, in a park with a ton of pigeons all over them, you know, but you're not going to be that because I know that. Um, Rosemary, you make books and cartoons that connect people with the natural world. Um, you've got a book called Bird and Moon, um, or should I say your Bird and Moon Nature Comets won the National Cartoonist Society, Cartoonists Society's Award for Best Online Short Form Comic, and they are they were subject of an award-winning museum exhibit. So you are obviously a, a cartoonist as well as a writer, and you make um, you also write best-selling science books for kids and adults, and you speak at bird festivals and other events, and you write for the Audubon society and you've done stuff for pbs in in america the tv channel uh kids show called eleanor wonders why so fantastic and i'm really happy to have you and i i, I noticed on on twitter as as i know it's most things these days that you had this book out and i thought i must get this woman on to talk about pigeons so take us back i know you got a little presentation for us but take us a, just tell us why why pigeons yeah, um, very good question. I have to ask, when you picked up, was it Feral Pigeons by Johnson and Janika? Was it the gray sort of yellow book when you picked up a book? That, that was probably it. It wasn't actually, it was a field guide oh. to birds of Britain, Europe, and Middle East. 
But that said, okay. I did at the same time um, pick up a book um, called The Street Pigeon by Eric Sims. He's a writer, um, broadcast, one, one of my heroes, The Street Pigeon. I actually got his desk copy because oh. he was my hero um, and he died in the early 90s and no, actually later than that. But when he died, I wrote a, an obituary online and his, his daughter picked up on it and said, I'm really touched by what you said. And um, would you like his desk copy? And I thought, Jesus, of course I would. Wow. Yeah, there, there are not a lot of books about pigeons and there are even fewer books about feral pigeons. And I feel like I've purchased all of them and they're in my house. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I, uh, I grew up living in cities. So I think that was a lot of, um, a lot of why I got into urban birding really, really young. Uh, my mom was a big bird watcher and my dad was a big urbanite. And he grew up on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. Um, in New York. And so he remembered birds. He didn't know any birds until he met my mom. And he knew the city birds as the little brown ones, which were the house sparrows, the gray ones, which were the pigeons, and then the seagulls. He knew the seagulls and that was it. Um, and I guess that story really connected with me. And so as I continued to live in cities and continued to watch birds, I started to think, well, these urban birds are so much more interesting than, than people give them credit for. And I, I wish other people were watching them, but I think I didn't, I mean, I was a little amb ambivalent too, until I started to learn more about their history of domestication. And that was when I realized, oh no, there is a story here that has been buried that is so fascinating. And it's, it says so much about humans and our, you know, our interactions with the natural world. And I, th I said, I have to write a book. So I'm really thrilled that I got to write a book about it. I wished if I was able to hold it up physically and show people. Um, unfortunately, um, because of uh, got one. situations beyond my control, there you go. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm they're hard to, to find. Them. They're out there somewhere. But yeah. I'll tell you what, Zoomers, I mean, it's a, it's a book worth getting. It's really, it's written with real, real um, sort of humour and on top of that, it's actually very factual. I learned a few things myself, not that I know everything, of course, but it was really interesting to read through that because you covered everything. I was I was expecting, I was thinking, oh, maybe she shouldn't do that. She did she did that plus plus ten thousand other things more. So congratulations. What a great book. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means so much. I feel like it's one of those books, you know, my publisher was saying people will pick it up because the cover looks funny to them. And then, then we can hit them with all the facts. So I'm, I'm really honored when people realize how much nerdiness I put in my ed. I think my editor probably cut out about a third of the extra material <laughs> that I kept wanting to add. Cause I just, there's so much cool stuff there. I wanted to share. Yeah, and also your illustrations are absolutely great as well. I mean, not only have you illustrated the pigeons, I mean, sometimes with the humour, obviously, uh, but also other species around the world as well. And, you know, sometimes as a purist, because sometimes I am a purist, I looked at it and I can see that that bleeding heart pigeon actually was a bleeding heart pigeon. You know, it looked like one as opposed to some caricature, even though it is a cartoon. So it's really, you know, I thought it was very well done. Good work. Yeah. That was really intimidating, the drawing part, because I'm not a scientific illustrator and I'm not, I, I mean, um, David Sibley read it, which was the most terrifying experience of my life because over here, he's our big, our big bird guide guy and he's an, an actual bird painter. So yeah, yeah he, I do. He I is do God. Of, he's yeah. one of the gods of birding, that man. Yeah. He's a man yeah. that when I met him for the first time, I, I sunk to my knees before even saying hello to him. I had to <laughs> sink to my knees and say, please, oh, am I worthy to even talk to you? And he's, but he's the nicest, shyest, quietest person. It's, it's, yeah, it's so funny. But yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm a cartoonist. I'm not an illustrator, but I tried to get all the field marks in so you could at least tell what I was, what I was getting at. Yeah, it's very good. Um, well, I don't know if I should say any more. Maybe we should look at your presentation and then, you know, because I'm going to be asking you questions that may be covered in your little thing you're going to show us now. So, Zoomers, um, Rosemary's about to show us uh, a quick, um, I hate the word presentation. I also hate the word PowerPoint. What's the best way to describe yeah, it? I promise it'll be more interesting than, than you think when you hear PowerPoint. Yeah, it's not, forget PowerPoint, okay. forget the word presentation. She's gonna show us some stuff. If you wanna see it in the best possible way, change your, your setting if you've got it on gallery, change it to speaker view so you can get the full glory. 
Rosemary, over to you. Excellent. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to talk about um, myself a little bit and also pigeons a little bit. Um, and and uh, like David said, it should be pretty speedy. So quick, first off, a quick intro to myself. So I'm Rosemary Mosco, and I'm a cartoonist and a science writer, and I'm really thrilled to be talking to you all today. And um, I, that's, a, that's kind of a long way of introducing myself. So I like to call myself a science communicator, except a lot of people don't know what that is. <laughs> so what that is, is that someone who bridges the gap between scientists and the public. So we talk to scientists, we talk to the public, we try to figure out a way to make some common ground and to build bridges between those groups. And what that means is, you know, a lot of very different things. So I've gotten to go out in the field. Um, here I am tracking black bears in Florida on the left and on the right, looking at some really cool purple pitcher plants up in Maine. Those are carnivorous plants that we have up here, um, up in a bog. And I spend most of my time behind a computer. So I've done articles for Audubon here. Um, like David said, I wrote for a, a kids show called Eleanor Wonders Why. And I've done some fun graphic design like this pint glass you can see on the bottom right that was for a herpetological meeting. So um, herpetologists have drunk beer out of my creation, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I spend most of my time writing books though. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about a pocket guide to pigeon watching, getting to know the world's most misunderstood bird in the second half of this little talk, but I've got some other ones for people of different ages. Most people though don't know me for my books, they know me for my cartoons and my charts. Um, and here are a couple of them. And I put them all online at birdandmoon.com if you wanna go and check them out. So growing up, I split my time between being outside in nature and being indoors. So here I am growing up in um, Ottawa, Canada, a very snowy place. And I've got one of our black cap chickadees there and I'm feeding, feeding a chickadee. My mom knit my scarf. Like my whole history is in this, this kind of blurry photo um, of me. And so I was outside and then I was inside reading cartoons. And at the time it was all newspaper cartoons, which is totally dating myself. So it was Farside, Calvin and Hobbes, Bloom County, for better, for worse, so many other newspaper cartoons. And then I made my own cartoons. So here is a cartoon that I made and that's an American Robin, which I, I hear folks in the UK, you have one over there, which is very exciting, um, right now, hopefully it doesn't get eaten by another red kite. Um, and it is uh, looking down at a wormhole and the um, wife worm is saying to the husband worm, there's that noise again, George, go see if that's the milkman, George. I am like 95% sure that I copied this joke from one of my many, many joke books, mostly because I was not born um, in a time of milkmen. So I'm not sure where I got that from, but yeah, I probably copied this from somewhere. So I really love nature exploration and I love drawing. And I knew at some point I was gonna to have to pick one of these two things for a career and I would have to jettison the other one. And the reason for that is that I knew what a scientist was or I had a really, really stereotyped view of what a scientist was. And I knew what an artist was, or again, I had a really stereotyped view of what that was like, but I didn't know anyone who did both. So I knew, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to dump one of those two things. Um, and this is a view that's reinforced a lot by media and by all sorts of different um, kind of messages that you wind up getting. So if you Google science and art, you get images like this, endless images like this. So what this shows is your brain, you've probably all seen pictures like this. Half of it is science. It looks honestly really boring to me, like very businessy. And then half of it is art. And that side is really fun and has like a bicycle and a coffee cup and a, a mustache. I don't know why, uh, and you, those are the two halves of your, your brain and there's no connection in the middle. And there are so many images like this. I actually collect these. Every time I see one of these, I add it to a folder. Um, this is not how science and art work and it's not even how the brain works if there are any neuroscientists in, in the chat. Um, this is not how any of this works. And slowly over time, I was comforted to learn that this view was wrong and that people have been mixing science and art for tens of thousands of years. So I'm gonna share just a couple of my favorite examples. So first off, 
This here is a cave painting of an animal called an Irish elk, Megaloceros giganteus, which was just a gigantic deer uh, that is sadly now extinct. I kind of wish they were still running around. So this is art from the Gat de Cugnac in France. It is roughly 25,000 years old. And what's cool about this painting is that cave people were literally, you know, eating these animals. They saw them when they were alive and they really got to know these animals. So this art has something that you can't find in all of the, the bones that we've dug up. It's got some fleshy stuff, like there's a hump on the back of these two Irish elk, and there are these two kind of dark lines coming down off of the hump. And this is stuff that wouldn't be preserved in fossils. And so what this allows us to do is modern day illustrators like Mark Witten here can basically have a conversation with people who lived 25,000 years ago to make an accurate piece of art about the Irish elk, which blows my mind. So this is all speculative, it's really incredible. But to me, this is a conversation across tens of thousands of years. And there are so many more examples. So this here, you know, just glancing at it, you probably wouldn't realize what this is. It is a toilet. This is the earliest drawing of the flush toilet by Sir John Harrington, who apparently was related to Kit Harrington from Game of Thrones. Um, this is from 1596. There's a lot of fish swimming around in the top of that toilet. I don't really know why. Another piece of science art, Antony von Leeuwenhoek was one of the earliest users of the microscope. He liked to um, look at all kinds of gross body things under the microscope. This is some scrapings from between his teeth. And he discovered these critters kind of crawling around, which is incredible. And the bird world, of course, has such a long history of using art um, along with the science. So on the left, Elizabeth Gould, whose husband was the famed ornithologist, John Gould. And on the right, Alex Warnick, who's a modern day watercolor artist, just this beautiful, beautiful stuff. So. Over time, I realized art and science can really reinforce and help each other. And this was a mix that I could possibly make work. So I got lucky. I found a graduate program called the Field Naturalist Program at the University of Vermont. And um, this was a program that, that always brought in at least one artist and sometimes some other writers too. It was really cool. And you can see on the bottom left there, that's me on graduation day. I'm in the middle. I got to wear one of those cool hats. They gave us shovels so we could dig our own soil pits. Um, and it was a really incredible experience. And so I spent a lot of time outside. Anyone who knows ferns knows you spend a lot of time looking at the tiny reproductive bits of ferns um, under the leaves, under the penny. And then I also got to do some art. So this was a fun project. I worked with, <clears throat> excuse me, with a soil scientist who had figured out how to digitize images of cross sections of soil. And then I took that and turned it into a prototype for a video game where you are little nematodes swimming through the, the water between the soil particles. And that was really cool. They encouraged that. So this program really gave me the confidence to mix science and art, but there was one more piece that I was missing. And you may have noticed that so far I've been a little bit serious because the piece I was missing was humor. Humor is um, surprisingly important. So uh, the thing about humor is that I like to say that it gives science wings. So if you take a piece of science, no matter how dry, and you add a joke to it, it will spread much farther than you could possibly imagine. Um, so humor is really this powerful way to spread science. So uh, I guarantee that in fact, many of you can probably think of at least one example of a time you learned some science from humor. And I'd love to hear some of yours later on. Here are two examples from me. So one of them is this comic. Uh, I remember reading Calvin and Hobbes, like I said, when I was a kid, and there was a comic about a song sparrow and Calvin turns into a song sparrow and he sings this beautiful song, but it's really this horrible song. So song sparrows, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this North American sparrow that is very streaky looking. And this is a really accurate representation of a song sparrow. And this was how I learned what this species was, which was pretty cool. I also grew up watching The Simpsons. And there was a moment where Lisa Simpson is teaching Maggie Simpson some more unusual animals and she teaches her how to say zebu, zebu. So I learned what a zebu was. I had no idea it's this humped form of cattle and that will never leave my head thanks to the Simpsons. So people really like humor when it's relatable and that enables us to connect with wildlife on a more personal level and hopefully to feel that impetus to protect it. So here's an example of a comic I made about birds that winds up being kind of personally relatable, at least to some folks. 
So we all know bird behavior is incredible, right? There's such bizarre variety. This is a skimmer. Um, over here we have black skimmers. This is an African skimmer. It's an incredible bird that has a longer lower bill. It flies along, um, snapping shut its bill when it finds a cool fish. They're just, just really remarkable birds. Here is some more bird behavior. This is a Jackson's widow bird. It is trying to impress a mate. It's doing its absolute best. Um, this is what it, what it does. It's doing its best. And this here is a bird that uh, will start showing up in my neighborhood, hopefully in a few weeks, called the American Woodcock that does this boogie dance. And as far as I know, we still aren't totally sure why they do this dance, whether it's a feeding thing or a territorial thing, but it's so funny. So uh, the thing about all these behaviors is they're instinctive. They happen without the bird really kind of sitting down and thinking, I'm gonna do this thing. So I started to ask myself, do birds ever have a moment where they think, wait, why am I doing this goofy dance? So I made this cartoon and it's called Instinct is Weird. And this yellow warbler, I'm again, everything is very North America focused and I apologize because that's where I'm at. So she says, I made this for some reason. These are my smooth round children. Oh no, now it's loud. Help. So uh, this comic didn't occur to me as being immediately relatable, but um, there's a reason for it, which is that I have so many friends who are having kids and they all have this moment where they love their, their baby so much and the baby is screaming so much and they think, why did I bring this very loud thing into my life? <laughs> And there's a little bit of a similarity there between that experience of the bird kind of realizing, oh, instinct made me do this interesting thing. So uh, why do I focus on comics when there's so many other cool media that I could possibly do? Well, uh, I really like comics because the format kind of lends itself to conveying important information. And um, here are a couple examples of things you might not think of as comics. So this here is a piece of information that you get when you get on an airplane. So you're given basically a comic book. It's very boring. It's kind of scary. It's about what happens if something terrifying happens on an airplane. It doesn't use words so that it can be more international. Um, although you might ask yourself, why is everybody white in this image? That's a good question, um, but it's a cartoon. And similarly, we're all familiar with these at this point. I would argue this is a cartoon. You are welcome to argue that it's not, but it's a series of images drawn with a, with a caption and it's progressing through time. Each, each little slice is an instance in time. It's basically a cartoon. So it's a good way for us to learn. So I uh, love making cartoons and I also really love making books. And so now I'm gonna turn to talking a little bit more about my, my pigeon book, which is a book where I've used my cartooning skills to illustrate it. So uh, here is a bit about my latest book, which has an, a bit of a mouthful title. So it's called A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. And brace yourself because here comes a flood of pigeon propaganda. So ask yourself, when was the last time you really thought about city pigeons? I mean, really thought about it before this talk. Because for most of us, you know, like David said, they're just kind of part of the background. Depending on who you are and what you're doing, you might find them annoying. You might get mad that they're pooping on your car. Um, you might get mad that they're cluttering up your, your eBird list or whatever list you like to use to record your birds. But um, when you really look at pigeons super close, you will find that they are amazing birds, completely astonishing birds. Here are three facts that I love and I'll elaborate on these. Pigeons ride the subway, they live in castles, both mom and dad pigeons make milk to feed their babies, and there's so much more incredible stuff about pigeons. So let's take a much closer look at our friend the pigeon, starting with the question, what is a pigeon? So pigeons are birds in the scientific family Columbidae. And this is uh, a bird family whose name comes from the Latin word for dove. And it's a really incredible family full of amazing pigeons, doves, and even some non-pigeons and doves, which raises the question, what is the difference between a pigeon and a dove? So there is no meaningful scientific difference. This is one of my favorite um, things, pieces of trivia to tell people. Within the family Columbidae, English-speaking people just sort of named some birds pigeons and named some birds doves. 
there is no genetic kind of link between all the pigeons and all the doves. It's pretty random. In some cases, we decided to name the sort of more tiny and delicate birds doves and the, and the bigger ones pigeons, but that doesn't always hold true. So there's really no scientific difference, which means that the pigeons that poop on people are the same as the elegant dove that Noah released from his ark. So really Noah just grabbed a homing pigeon and hucked it out the side of his boat. There are some non-pigeon birds in Columbity too. The dodo was recently recategorized as a pigeon. And if you look at this, this image, you can see it. You know, that head is kind of pigeony, the tendency to walk around on the ground, which I think is kind of neat. And this right here is my favorite pigeon species of all time. This is the Nicobar pigeon. This is a bird that uh, lives in Southeast Asia and is just dripping with color and shine and class. And it's just such a cool, cool, cool bird. I kind of want an outfit that looks like the Nicobar pigeon. So for the purposes of this talk and for my book, I'm talking about the city pigeon. And this is, you know, one species inside of Columbity. It is Columba Livia, the word Livia coming from kind of a blue-gray color. It's also known as the rock dove or the rock pigeon, again, because pigeon and dove are the same. Rat with wings, common pigeon, or hey, you get off my balcony. And so I'm just going to call it the pigeon, but be aware that there are so many other amazing pigeons. So the wild ancestors of these pigeons lived in parts of Europe, Africa, and Asia. And you'll notice this is a really small map compared to where you can find city pigeons today. This is just a map I grabbed off Wikipedia. It's kind of impossible to figure out where wild pigeons used to live because of how long they have been domesticated and how much intermixing there has been. It's fascinating to me. So here is what happened. So 12,000 years ago, you know, we all know the story, some people in the Fertile Crescent developed agriculture. And here on the right is a map of the Fertile Crescent. It's just kind of a chunk of the Middle East. So these people settled down, they started to farm grain, they started to farm the land. And that is exactly what pigeons were excited about because pigeons love nothing more than running around on the ground and snapping up grain. And suddenly all these people were making a whole ton of grain. And so they were kind of hanging out. And then at some point between that 12,000 years ago and about 5,000, 4, 5,000 years ago when written writing starts to occur and we start to get actual records and so we don't really know when, people looked at those pigeons and they said, okay, I could use that. And they tamed them, they built special homes for them called dovecoats, and they started to control their breeding and shape them. And they domesticated them, just like the horse or the cow or the pig or the chicken or the cat or the dog. So pigeons are just a bunch of puppies. Okay, so why domesticate the pigeon? Because if you look at a cow, I mean, I guess you look at a cow and you think I could get milk out of that, but you also think, you know, maybe I could eat that. You look at a dog and you think, oh, that could, you know, be my companion or guard my home. But you look at a pigeon, you're sort of like, huh. But the thing about pigeons is I like to say they are the Swiss army knife of birds because they are incredibly, incredibly useful. They have so many different uses. Um, one of those tools in the Swiss army knife is poop because one of the reasons they were domesticated was poop. So if you live in an area where the soil needs a little bit of nourishment, um, especially a desert region, it's great to have a bunch of pigeon crap everywhere because you can put it on your fields and you can grow melons and cucumbers and all kinds of cool stuff. This poop is also, um, and it has an ingredient in it called saltpeter that was used for gunpowder. It can be used for leather working. So it's, it's Pigeon poop is actually really great stuff. And think of that next time your favorite statue is kind of coated in it. This was probably the main reason they were domesticated though, which is that you can eat them. And this here is an image of pigeon pie. So in North America and Europe, um, people used to eat massive amounts of pigeon. Here in North America, it was this huge source of protein. People have just forgotten that people used to eat pigeon, but it was this huge source of protein up until we started making factory farm chicken and we realized, oh, we can actually make a little more um, meat using this stuff. So I think that is really fascinating. And that's really just the start. Pigeons can be pets. They can carry messages. You take a pigeon far away from its nest attach a message to its leg and release it, it will fly 
and carry your message at great speed. Um, they can compete in races, which is a little com complicated, and I can talk about that a little later, how that all works. They can be bred for appearance, behavior, sound, and more. And this little fellow on the right was part of an early drone photography effort. Before we had drones, we were releasing pigeons in the air with little cameras on them. That actually looks pretty big, but it's a very light camera and getting some really blurry photos of cities from these pigeons flying around. So pigeons became important. And in fact, think about things like Ferraris that are high status objects. Now that's what pigeons were. So in some parts of the world, you were not allowed to keep pigeons if you were poor. The rich and powerful used to build castles, these dovecotes, these incredible structures to house their pigeons. So they were really keeping them in these fancy, incredible castles. Um, part of the French Revolution grievances was that the poor were not allowed to have pigeons. And so they started tearing down the pigeon coats of the rich. It's really wild. This is one of my favorite photos of all time. This is inside a dovecote from Iran from the 17th century. You're looking up into a pigeon tower. So pigeons in the wild used to nest in holes in cliffs. So this is what you build for your pigeons. So you can see I've circled in the bottom there. It's a little hard to see, but there are two pigeons in those little niches. Each one of these little niches or niches, however you pronounce it, would have had a pair of pigeons in their breeding, which is just incredible. It's such a beautiful structure. Pigeons were high class and they were also decorated war heroes. So they were essential military tech in World War I and World War II. People would bring pigeons into war. And then when they got in trouble, when the soldiers were under friendly fire, for example, they would release their pigeons with a note saying, help us out. That's why GI Joe here won um, his beautiful medal. There were all sorts of different pigeons that won medals and their names were household names. So, um, then colonists decided, okay, pigeons are incredibly important. There is no world without pigeons. And they started exporting them to all different parts of the world. And some of them escaped and went feral. And that is why they're in places like where I live in North America. They were not native to here. They were not native to much of Europe, much of Africa. They're in Australia. They're all over the place. And that's because colonists went, we need this tech. We have to bring this with us. And then we forgot. So if pigeons were so beloved, how did they go from, I have a beautiful metal to uh, we are rats of the sky and we are disgusting birds? Well, uh, one of the reasons is they became obsolete. So they're basically the fax machine of the sky. So uh, whereas we used to use their poop for fertilizer, we started using chemical fertilizer. And whereas we used to eat them, uh, people started to eat factory farm chicken and where we used to use them as messengers, we started using the telegraph or the radio or the internet, um, all that kind of stuff. So they became obsolete. And then something else happened, which is that we started to blame them for sickness. So this headline here comes from the New York Times in 1963. So in the 1960s in New York, um, pigeons were blamed for this meningitis outbreak. And the officials said, we have to kill all the pigeons. This meningitis will spread up and down the coast. Everyone will die, which was not true. It was not actually because of the pigeons, but that was really one of the reasons why people started to get scared of pigeons. But look at that date, 1963. So that's pretty recent. So this hatred of pigeons is really relatively new. And that's because we forgot where pigeons came from. So as a little reminder, here is where um, our fancy city pigeons came from, and that is their fancy purebred ancestors, which are really, really astonishing. So you've got these beautiful colored birds on the left, a Medina pigeon, on the right, a Nuremberg lark. Really, really gorgeous pigeons, so many incredible purebred pigeons. I mean, these may not be breeds that you're familiar with, but we've all heard of chihuahuas and Great Danes and Rhodesian Ridgebacks and all these like dog breeds, and that's basically what they're doing with pigeons. There are birds with fancy foot feathers and eyes. This here is a Saxon fairy swallow. The eye is actually missing the colored pigment. So you see the back of the eye, which is why the eye looks dark. In the legs, genes that are normally expressed in the wings are being expressed in the legs to make wing legs, which is kind of wild. There are birds with fancy crests. It is not surprising to look at this bird and realize that this was uh, one of Queen Victoria's favorite bird breeds. This here is the Jacobin and it cannot see out of the sides. It can only see out of the front. They actually have to trim the feathers around the head so that this bird can uh, adequately feed its young. 
And because of this ancestry, our feral pigeons are really beautiful. They come in all sorts of incredible colors. We've got these browns, these blue grays, whites here. You can see in these three birds at the bottom, the eye colors are different. The bill colors are different. There's so much color here as opposed to on the top left, which is what the wild form of the pigeon would have been. And um, if you're a genetics nerd in my talk, I talk all about the genetic basis for at least some of the colors and patterns and characteristics. And I'm not gonna get into that here, but there's a whole bunch of it if that's your kind of thing. And of course, pigeon breeders have known about this stuff for, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and it's not just about color, you get cool structures like this crest here on the left in a, domestic, in a feral pigeon or this feathery feet here on the right. Um, and then once you start noticing these cool colors, you will notice really fun stuff like behaviors. So uh, let's take a look at just a couple of really fun pigeon behaviors. So what's this bird doing here on the left? Well, what it is doing is it is in love. So pigeons, I was surprised to learn, are romantics. They stick together, um, pairs stick together for life. And they're remarkably faithful compared to a lot of birds, which is really strange. And males will dance to impress their mates. This is called the, the bow coup. So this male here is really showing off to his uh, pigeon wife. And both male and female pigeons are capable of producing milk in their crop and they feed their babies with it. It is stimulated by the hormone prolactin, just like in humans. It's got all the good stuff that human milk has. It convergently evolved, which is wild. So it just sort of was a thing that pigeons stumbled across evolutionarily. It's so cool. And lastly, pigeons ride the subway. They do this all over the world. Um, why do they do it? because our subway cars are a warm box full of tasty food and all their favorite humans. It's not because they know where they're going, they don't. I suggest we put a teeny tiny map at about pigeon eye level so that they can figure out where they're going because usually they just do what this pigeon does which is they leave and they fly back home. So there's a lot to enjoy about pigeons and lately people are sort of falling back in love with pigeons. And I think that one of those reasons is that pigeons are underdogs and we love underdogs and sometimes pigeon struggles are very relatable like this bird here getting hit by the chilly winter weather directly into the face. Uh, of course, it's not all sunshine and flowers, so because pigeons sometimes come into conflict with people. So someone in New York City sent me this incredible image. Now think about that dove coat I showed you from Iran. That's basically what this architect built here unintentionally. This is the outside of a building. This is a dove coat here. So there's a little, there's a pigeon or a pigeon couple in each one of these little niches. Um, and if the architect had maybe known a little bit more about pigeons, this might not have occurred. Um, so if you're worried about troubleshooting your pigeons, I have a section in my book about pigeon troubleshooting and hopefully it will help you help pigeons and help yourself and just avoid any of the issues that can definitely occur with such an abundant urban species and hopefully it will make your lives easier. So watching pigeons is easy and it connects us with nature, history and our humanity. And that in my mind is what pigeons can give to us or at least it's one of the many things that pigeons <laughs> like to give to us. Um, so that's my pigeon spiel. So again, Rosemary Mosco, um, I'm at birdandmoon.com and rosemarymosco.com. And uh, thank you for letting me uh, indoctrinate you into the world of the pigeons. That was fabulous. It's so fabulous, I had to change my hat. I mean, I just found it. <laughs> I love that hat. I just found it fantastic. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for that. I mean. It, as I said earlier at the top of this whole broadcast that um, the book is fun and it really as you are, I think you're an excellent communicator science communicator because it yeah. really brought across all the bits that I didn't think you would talk about, but in a way that would engage, you know, if it engaged my mum that it engage anyone so I'm really fantastic. Um, I've been thinking about pigeons a lot, obviously, since knowing that you were coming. And um, one thing I've noticed over the years in UK is that there's been a steady decline in pigeons, unbelievably, because most people think, oh, they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous. But in fact, um, my colleagues at the British Trust for Ornithology tell me that I think there's roughly around about 250,000 pairs in the UK, which 
I thought was the number on my street at one point compared to their close cousin, the wood pigeon, which you mentioned in your book as well, by the way, um, which I think is something like 6 million pairs uh, swelling up to 10 million plus during the winter. Are you seeing the same thing in, 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 in America? Because I know in the UK, part of the reason is because they're blocking off all the spots where they used to nest and plus a lot of derelict buildings are not, no longer there. Yeah, absolutely. So it's definitely happening here. It's really difficult to find um, accurate information on how many how pigeons are doing globally. But there was that study that came out a few months ago that talked about which birds were incredibly abundant. And I was surprised to see birds, you know, like the Bicknell's thrush are ridiculously abundant. But pigeons are not as abundant as you would think. And I think they are declining, I think partly because of you know differences in the ways that we tackle our cities, cleaning up rubbish. We don't have horses around spilling grain. You know, there's so much complex stuff like that. Um, but I think that it's easy to forget that pigeons are not as numerous maybe as other birds because they really are where we are. So if you go into the middle of a redwood forest, you won't see any pigeons. But if you go pretty much anywhere where there's humans and there's food, they're there because they want to be near us, which is wild. And I think contributes to partly why, at least here, they're not really considered an invasive species, whereas the starling and the house sparrow definitely are and all sorts of other birds are because they are where where we are. That's not to say that they're not problematic, um, but they just really want to hang out with us because they've been our companions for 10,000 years. Exactly. I mean, they're one of the very few truly urban birds. It's very rare you see one away from a city. And if you do see it, particularly if, if you're, when you show that map of the distribution, if you're, in, for example, in Europe, if you're in the, the top of Scotland or you know the edges of Ireland, or even in where I am in Spain, out in the countryside, it's more likely to be a rock dove than it is a feral pigeon. But even then, the poor old rock dove is declining because of cross breeding, breeding with the pigeon. Now, what's interesting is you mentioned this earlier is the fact that people have this sort of dual kind of thought when it comes to pigeons. There's the pigeons over there, which are the devil. And then you've got the doves. Oh, the doves are so wonderful. And as you quite correctly say, I mean, they're interchangeable because look at the pigeon itself, the feral pigeon, street pigeon, whatever, and it's, it's ancestral sort of father, parent is a rock dove. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think that even though I was ostensibly writing a book about birds, I really want to talk about humans and how we think about so much of this this you know wild stuff around us so i looked into why we have two words why we have pigeon and dove and i the the nearest the best theory i was able to come across was that it dates back to the norman conquest of england so pigeon 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 um, that's french and dove comes from a kind of germanic um, old english kind of root so i think that it was another one of those words where um, the french came over and they had a word for the thing we were eating which was pigeon which is it's very similar to, you know, beef um, comes from French and cow is English. So I think it was one of those things, but it wound up, um, interestingly, that pigeon was not the sort of more refined word, but we basically decided, okay, these birds are refined and these birds are gross and there's just no division. I think that that says a lot about English and a lot about how we think about the natural world, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, which obviously has to change. I mean, the pigeon family, um, per se, as you've mentioned in your book, a lot of them are in trouble and some of them is too far gone now. I mean, obviously the passenger pigeon is a classic example of a bird that was super abundant, gone. And over in Europe at the moment, we're having a massive situation with the turtle dove, a bird that's mm -hmm. mentioned in folklore and history, yet you stop someone in the street and say, what's a turtle dove? They couldn't even tell you. And also, they couldn't tell you anyway, because the population has dropped by over 90% over the last 30 years. Wow. What is it with people and pigeons? You mean in terms of being disgusted by them? And or in terms them, of just... shooting and killing them, why? Yeah, I are, mean... Are you, are you, I mean, I felt as a kid, I, when I learned about a passenger pigeon, I was so upset. That story and the Eskimo Curly story really upset me. And I felt really angry. I thought, how dare you? stop me from seeing this wonderful thing that happened you know a couple hundred years ago do you feel the same do you feel that emotion yeah i mean absolutely but i also feel like 
learning a little bit more about pigeons in the passenger pigeon story, um, again, it kind of, it was really eye-opening about humans in general. So uh, I grew up, you know, obviously in North America, we had the passenger pigeon. I grew up sort of being told that this was a bird that died because humans are terrible. Um, we're not really going to say what happened, but humans are bad. Passenger pigeon gone. Let's not do that again. And in researching this book, I realized that the passenger pigeons were, again, because we used to eat pigeon, which we forgot, they were a key food source for a bunch of indigenous peoples here, especially the Seneca who called them big bread. So like this was the food source, like these are incredible, like they're migratory. So when they come through and they'd be breeding, um, the Seneca would go and they would sustainably harvest them. Uh, which I think is really fascinating. They had a whole complex way of, of harvesting them that didn't um, decrease the population. So humans weren't really the problem with passenger pigeons, but then the colonists came over and they went, oh, look at this endless supply of birds. The indigenous people don't know anything. We're just gonna kill them all. And they, they, will, never, they will never stop existing. They're so incredible. So to me, it's more kind of a story of global power and movement and less a story of you know just humans being really terrible. So I feel like there's sort of lessons there. And what's wild is, of course, the colonists came over with their pigeons, with the Columbo Livia pigeons. And there was sort of a supplanting of one pigeon, you know, in, in favor of another pigeon. I just think that's the weirdest story. But yeah, I would love to see a passenger pigeon someday. They're, by all accounts, they were so beautiful. I don't know. I think pigeons can be more beautiful than people think they can be. Yeah, I actually stroked a passenger pigeon once. One of the specimens. Yeah. Where, where I wasn't was supposed it? to tell anyone, but I, I stroked it. I was in the uh, the uh, Cornell laboratory. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> good thing this isn't being broadcast anyway. <laughs> well, it will be shortly. Um, right. Just pigeon, with me. There's, there's, we talked about it earlier, and I think there might be a cultural difference maybe because you use, you use the word pigeon, um, was it fancier or something? But anyway, when I hear the word pigeon fancier or words along those lines, I cringe because I think, you know, weird old lady in the park covered in pigeons, or I think about people who race pigeons. And I know there's a lot of famous people out there that, you know, it's all you know cool to race pigeons and have pigeons like, for example, Tyson, Mike Tyson. I remember someone saying to me, oh, Mike Tyson likes birds. And I was thinking, oh, he's a bird and actually he's a pigeon fancier. Yep. Yep. No disrespect to pigeon fanciers, by the way, if, any, if there's any out there now or in the future. But um, some of the pigeon fanciers I know, pigeon racers, whatever, you, they have this real vendetta against birds of prey, against peregrines in particular. And but when you look at the pigeons they have, for example, one breeds the, the tumbler bridge, the pigeon, the one that sort of flies up and tumbles. I mean, come on. I mean, a peregrine in its environment will see this bird tumbling in the sky. He's going to think this is injured or whatever. I need to do the thing to clean out, you know, the gene pool and, and get, get moving on this. So what, what do these people expect? Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a, a complicated issue. Um, I'm, I'm sure part of it too is that the birds of prey were exterminated from a lot of places. And so you could be a pigeon fancier for a while and not worry about some of those birds of prey. And now the birds of prey are coming back at normal population levels and it's causing this conflict. I I, I don't know. I, I find it frustrating. It's It's really complicated. I feel like I got a better understanding of pigeon fancying when I started to see it as sort of like fancy dog breeding or fancy cat breeding. Um, and that some of the dogs and cats that we breed would also have a really hard time um, being out in the wild in any form, which is partly why when you look at feral pigeons, you don't see some of those fancier birds. You don't get tumblers, you don't get, you know, Jacobin pigeons with their with their fluff because those ones get picked out pretty early on. Um, and so a lot of our feral populations are descended from racers, which obviously do okay when they're when they're out. But for the majority of domestic birds, they will get picked off pretty early on when they're released out into the wild. Um, and so I urge people if they come across a bird that's pretty clearly someone's pet or or some escaped you know domestic bird to try to rescue it because the vast majority of those ones are gonna be picked off. And the ones that are out and feral are the survivors, the, the generations of the really tough survivors that have managed to pull through. But yeah, I, I find that, that really complicated. And also pigeons are kind of the natural predator 
of the uh, natural natural prey of the peregrine. I mean, they they co-evolved. They're, they're, peregrines eating pigeons makes complete sense. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I was very happy when, you know, for example, in Britain, the population of peregrines went to an all-time low just after the Second World War, a handful of maybe 60 pairs. And now they've learned to live in, in sort of, you know, urban areas and pigeons are the main course. So that was one thing I was really grateful for. In terms of pigeons being around it, for it's interesting pigeons. they from what i could tell the pigeons don't make a big dent though in those urban pigeon populations um people wonder you know if you have if you have a peregrine falcon around will you be able to keep the pigeons at bay but really the limiting factor in your urban pigeon seems to be food so more food means more babies um so the peregrines will pick off a few birds and you know be able to make a living but those hardened urban pigeons have really figured out how to keep themselves going, even with a predator there. Yeah, of course, in London, we've got a new uh, rat with wings, for want of a better, or better phrase, word. And that is, um, or better name even, and that is the parakeet, the rose wing parakeet. And I've yeah. noted that peregrines are now switched to this more exotic dish. So I'm happy about that too. Yeah, I have two little pet parrots. Um, so there's definitely a part of me that was very excited when I was in London and I saw those parakeets and I just, I figure you are all so bored of them now and I was, you know, I was so excited. It's kind of like when the American Robin, you know, is flew over to the UK and everyone there is like, oh my goodness, an American Robin. There's like 20 of them right outside my window right now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But parakeets and pigeons have those incredibly long, slender kind of tapering wings that are really designed to be very, very, very fast and to evade um, peregrine falcons. So I think they're pretty evenly matched. Yeah, and I must uh, also for the future tell people that I have no real sort of hard feelings against parakeets or pigeons um, in the day, because I think especially parakeets in London, they, despite the fact they make a lot of noise and drown out the dawn chorus, they also draw people into nature. So, you know, you have to say, be thankful for that. Now, in your book, you talk about various aspects of the anatomy and how pigeons work. And one thing that really kind of struck me, which I didn't know about at all, was their lungs and the fact that they don't expand. Can you explain that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You may be able to hear that, but a bunch of Canada geese just flew by. Oh, we love it. Don't, don't be sorry about that. We love, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> they were so loud. Um, yeah. So I used pigeons as a way to talk about some cool aspects of bird anatomy in general. And one of the things, so I was, I was kind of trying to talk about how pigeons are weirdly alien and also weirdly familiar at the same time. So birds have this incredible lung system where they have two lungs, just like you or I, but those lungs don't expand and contract. So what they do have is a whole set of, of these kind of um, air sacs that are surrounding the lungs and even extend up into the wings, which I think is really remarkable. So those air sacs are what channel the air over the lungs. And so there's this incredibly efficient thing where the air will come in and then it'll kind of stream over the lungs in one way and the lungs are able to um, pull out as much oxygen as they possibly can. And it's just more efficient than our system. It's so much more complex, but they need a system that efficient so that they're able to fly and pull as much oxygen out of, you know, out of the air as they can. And I think that's really incredible. I have a diagram in my book of all of those air sacs that's really simplified. And um, it's, it's such, such cool anatomical stuff. What advice would you give to someone watching this now or in the future who wants to combine what you did you know combine art with science to be you know to, to communicate what kind of advice would you give them yeah i guess i would say that even though there's more of an, an emphasis on STEAM, I don't know if you have that over there, but this the STEM thing, the science, technology, engineering, and math, and now there's an A for art. Um, there's sort of a nod towards art now, but I feel like there's still a sense that art and science are very, very separate and that um, they're just two different career paths. So for me, it was a lot of kind of feeling things out and trying different opportunities and just not feeling like I had any sort of guidance or anything like a mentor or anything like that. So I would say just stick it out, just keep trying different things. 
um, and keep looking for opportunities. And they're definitely out there. They're just under a million different names. And so you're not going to have a straightforward career path, but it's something that you can do if you just kind of keep chipping away at it. Well, I must congratulate you for finding a path and sticking with it because it takes people like you to create these opportunities for other people to then think, ah, oh, I can do that too. So props to you, definitely. Rosemary. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, you, I mean, you you too, obviously. I mean, I feel like birds of a feather, like there are alternative, you know, science careers out there. And it's, it's good to be able to show people that they exist. Exactly. Talking about existing, if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding war or COVID, where would you be right now? I... Anywhere on the planet is tricky because there's places I'd love to be in the US right now, like in Southern Texas where the birds are really excellent. But I think I would wanna go to Australia. If there was a way I could get to Australia without the plane trip, I wanna go see all the parrots. There are tours of the parrot, just the parrots. And I think it would be so cool to be in a continent of just parrots everywhere. Yeah, it'd be great to see the night parrots one there, one of the big specialities, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, what is your favorite pigeon? I think you might mention it earlier, but you might change your mind. Or you might have to. Yeah, I still, I still, well, so the bleeding heart doves are very cool. Those are those doves that look like they've been shot in the chest. And I mean, if you haven't seen a picture of this, you should Google it. It's got, it looks exactly like there's a blood stain. It's really bizarre, but it's just kind of the way they look. There's a bunch of different species of bleeding heart dove, but I think it would have to be the Nicobar because they're so gorgeous. They're in every aviary. They're just um, these big kind of goofy birds. Apparently their diet is a lot of the poop of other doves that are incapable of digesting some of the seeds that the Nicobar pigeon is capable of digesting. So they're just kind of these ridiculous, amazing, beautiful animals. And I love them so much. Fantastic. Um, Zoomers, just to let you know, um, we've got a couple more um, coming up in terms of interviews. Um, on February, this actually is seven, what day is it today? Today's the 10th. Okay, well, at some point next week, I think, we've got um, Rodney Stotts and Kate Pipkin. I think it's February the 17th, that's right. Um, Rodney Stotts is a guy who was um, a drug dealer, did time, all that sort of stuff. Um, and he turned around and saw Bird of Prey. He lives in America, in America and he's now a falconer. So he's written a book about his life. So. Please come along to that. It'd be very interesting. He's a black guy who's interested in 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 falconry and also interested in getting people from poor neighbourhoods involved in nature through falconry. And on the twenty eighth of February, uh, we have a guy called Gerard Gorman, um, an English guy who who lives in Hungary, but he's one of the world's experts on woodpeckers, and he's written a book on rhinex. Do you know what a rhinex is, Rosemary? I do. Those are those ones where they do this display where they tilt their funny. head when they're nervous. Oh, I would love to see one of those. Oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. So who, who we're talking about Rhinex and other woodpeckers on the 28th of February. So please tune in for that. Um, okay, guys, um, I think it's time for us to, to leave it here. All I want to say is that if you want to see the Q&A coming up next, because it's going to cut for you if you're watching it on YouTube in a minute, um, become a member of the Urban Bird of World community and learn all about this sort of stuff and also see the Q&As to all of the In Conservation Withs, plus loads of discounts and stuff, products and services, so well worth investigating. So Rosemary, once again, thank you very much for sparing your time to talk about your amazing book. I wish you all the success with it. I hope, I, I just, you know, I'm just sad that I can't hold it up right now, but well done and congratulations and good luck it exists <laughs> thank you so much this was such a delight i had such a good time yes yeah, so i did i thank you and zoomers once again thank you for being here amazing evening um hope to see you again soon all i will say to you now is keep looking up